So the topic we need to cover today is prognosis of disease and reporting research. Now, let's define what do we mean by prognosis of disease. So prognosis is the prediction of the future course of disease following its onset. This is different from natural history of disease, which is the evolution of disease in the absence of medical intervention. <clears throat> That's different from clinical course, which is the evolution of disease which has come under medical care, and that's different from the outcome of disease, which is a measure of the end result of the medical care. So you need to distinguish clearly that these are four different things that we can be talking about when we're talking about the prognosis of disease. So just like we can look at risk factors that influence the development of the disease, we can also look at the risk factors which influence the prognosis of disease. So um, once disease has already been established, then you can uh, start thinking about prognosis as something that has risk factors and that has interventions. Remember so far we were only speaking about community level thinking, risk factors for disease in the community, uh, interventions to prevent disease in the community, all right? But we were not talking about what then happens to people who get the disease and get to the hospital or come under medical care. So now we are talking about this, you know, we've moved away from the community now, um, uh, where we were discussing concepts of risks, interventions and the burden. Now we moved and we are only talking about the people who suffer from disease and they've moved and came under the attention of care. You see, if they don't come under the attention of care, then we're going to be talking about natural history of disease. We will just see what's going to happen to them without any care in the community. But if they do come um, under uh, care, they, we, then we talk about clinical course, about the prognosis and the, the outcomes. But prognosis, obviously, is the most general <coughs> term here. So, when you have one and five year survival rates for carcinoma of the breast for all stages and localized. So, uh, you're looking at one year survival, localized breast cancer, 96%. All stages together, 88%. So, clearly, um, the, uh, the, whether the cancer is localized or whether we're taking all stages into account, this is a risk factor that influences the prognosis of disease, you know. It's not a risk factor for getting a disease because, uh, you know, this is not, doesn't have anything to do with uh, healthy people, but it does have distinguish between those who have the disease. Um, five year survival, look at localized and all uh, stages, look at the difference, all right? So, Basically, we can talk about risk factors, but not in terms of development of disease, but in terms of the prognosis of disease. Survival according to histological grading of breast uh, cancer. So grade one, that's the least malignant. Uh, this is what the survival looks like from the first to the 15 years. This is the grade three. Clearly, you have much worse prognosis if your breast cancer is uh, uh, more malignant, more um, uh, aggressive histologically than if it's not. And look at multiple factors operating here. Uh, this is a case fatality uh, at the surgery or after the surgery for cholecystectomy, uh, for cholecystis, right? So cholecystectomy, uh, let's see what happens when you have this surgery. If you have age less than 50, 50 to 69 and 70 plus, you can see that those who are younger always have smaller numbers than those who are older. So age at surgery is clearly a risk factor for the outcome. Now you can have another one, good preoperative status and poor preoperative status. And you can say that those with good preoperative status uh, always have better outcomes than poor preoperative status. And then female and male, you can see that females always have better outcomes than males. So a multitude of factors contributes to the prognosis of this intervention, right? And um, incidence of stroke by degree of control of hypertension. If you have good control versus poor control, the incidence of, smoke is, uh, of stroke is going to be completely uh, different, right? Uh, even in the people 
with, um, with the diastolic blood pressures of the similar level. So in summary, the extent of disease spread, the age, the sex, the physical status, exposure to risk factors, treatment, they can all have a big impact on the prognosis of disease. Okay, and now going back to what I told you, you need to, when you think about the risk factors, you need to ask yourself what you're talking about. Because you start off being well, you're exposed to some risk factor, and then you have the onset of disease. And then here, you don't, no longer call them risk factors, you actually start calling them prognostic factors. They are risk factors for, you know, having a bad outcome of the disease once you got it. But we call them a risk factors and then we call them after the onset prognostic factors and then there is the outcome of the disease. And note that the risk factors and prognostic factors, same things can be in both categories. So age is both a risk factor to get a heart attack and then it becomes a prognostic factor for uh, what's going to happen. Male sex is a risk factor for heart attack uh, cigarette smoking is a risk factor, but then completely different things become prognostic factors, anterior infarction, hypertension. You see, hypertension is a risk factor, but once you have a heart attack, if you have a hypertension, that's a bad prognostic uh, sign, all right? Um, uh, so uh, serum, serum cholesterol can have a, be a risk factor, but then once people get a heart attack and survive, they're going to be on a lower cholesterol lowering treatments, and they're going to, uh, this is no longer going to be a prognostic factor, all right? Good. So, what are the rates that we commonly use to describe prognosis? Five years survival is a very good one, you know, proportion of patients that survive five years following the onset of disease. Case fatality, that's the proportion of patients with disease who actually die of it. Remission, proportion of patients entering the phase in which disease is no longer detectable. And recurrence, that's proportion of patients who have return of disease after a disease-free interval. Now, careful, because although you have exactly the same five-year survival, like here, 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 and here, that, not, that doesn't tell you the same story about what really happens. If you have a solitary pulmonary nodule, which is indicative of lung cancer usually, this is the, what the prognosis is going to be. It's going to drop quite fast. If you have dissecting aneurysm, you know, most people die very soon, but then the rest die off slowly. Chronic granulocytic leukemia, it's a bit linear decline uh, because, we, you know, it's treatable or at least we can control it for a number of years. And if you're old, 95 years old, you have exactly the same five-year survival as if you had all these diseases, but the curve looks completely different, so you're, it's, it's declining in a completely different way. So clearly, although the five-year survival is the same in all four um, of these conditions or situations, this does not mean that you want, you, you have the same prognosis or all those four things have the same prognosis. They are, they have different prognosis, right? And now finally, we are moving to reporting your research. So now you know that risk factors and prognostic factors are practically the same. It's just that risk factors contribute to disease, prognostic factors contribute to disease outcomes. So remember that and uh, that you're, you'll be fine at the exam. Now, reporting research. Reporting research, we're going to talk about how do you report uh, research. The, usually, the usual way how we assess this course is we, we pick a study from the world literature like this one and uh, we ask you to find all the strengths and all the weaknesses of this study, to look for evidence of bias, to look for possibility of confounding, to look how the study handled chance effects, to dis define what was the design of this study, which type of study was used here and what was its aim and methods, and finally to make a conclusion whether this is a trustworthy study that should change our thinking or is it not, okay? And you will be amused and entertained by one of the most read paper of all time in history, which is by Professor John Ioannidis, who is now at Stanford, um, a, a true genius, who uh, writes great uh, articles about how we should conduct biomedical uh, research. Um, and uh, he, he, made, he wrote this essay when he was in one small Greek island that's a famous story having summer, he realized that 
thinking about one after the other problem with any study, he realized that the vast majority of published research is actually going to necessarily going to be false. It's going to be false positive. And this is a really popular paper. Please try to find it and read it. You're going to learn a lot about what problems do we have to think about and worry about and encounter when we're doing research. Now, I'm going to try to teach you how to write a research article, okay? When you've written hundreds of research articles, it just becomes so clear that you can just literally sit down by, by your computer and write the whole paper in one afternoon. Because you know exactly after hundreds of papers what needs to be said at which place, and you realize that there is a structure to every research paper that is just is logical and uh, uh, it's quite simple actually and if you're understanding this and following this you're going to write a really good paper but if you don't then you're going to struggle what goes where, what to say where, what to say at all and so on. So if you're reporting the results of the research this is how you should do this, all right? Firstly you should start with the introduction and most people think this is irrelevant. Most people who start writing papers think introduction is irrelevant. You just copy paste some stuff from Wikipedia and you know set the stage, give definitions and move on to reporting your research. When I review papers I can tell based on introduction whether the paper is going to be accepted or not because introduction tells so much about how skilled and uh, experienced those who are reporting on this study are. It tells you just so uh, much. Because introduction needs to have three parts. Only three parts, three paragraphs. In the first part, you need to convince your reviewer that this is a big problem, important problem, which is worthy of investigation. All right? You have to start very broadly, putting things in the context and say this is a big problem or this is an important problem. This is a problem worthy of investigation. You have to convince me that it is. Then, on the top of that, you need to convince me that there are some remaining controversies or gaps in knowledge that are not filled. So that there are maybe 10 studies saying this and 7 studies saying that. Or that we know quite a lot about this but there is one key gap that we don't know. And then, in the third part, you need to explain in a few sentences how are you going to resolve this controversy for your study or fill this gap. If you do this well, I can tell you immediately whether this paper is going to be accepted or not. If I see unstructured introduction, which is too long, going on about things that really do not belong there and so on, I know that this is some beginner writing a paper who, who doesn't understand what they need to say in the introduction. And so many times, I mean I would say probably more than 90% of times I made a decision on the paper and didn't have to change it until the, uh, the end of the paper based on introduction. Probably more than 95% of the times. Maybe one in 20 papers starts poorly but then I think that um, it's a really good paper towards the end. Just needs to change the introduction. So, <laughs> so look what, what sometimes happens. Uh, any permit, uh, very frequently paper has two out of three, but not all three. So, sometimes I have a study which I think, oh, this is a really big problem. All right, this is certainly worthy of investigation. And then they convince me there is massive controversy about this problem, or there is a huge gap. But then <laughs> they offer to solve it in such a way that you can immediately see that this is not going to settle the controversy or fill the gap because the study just isn't designed or based on a sample size or thought through or made in the right place or in the right conditions to be able to to do this and then I immediately know forget it this is not I mean this is a big problem this is certainly a gap they understand that but this study is not going to help okay it's not it's just going to be yet another study that's going to be controversial okay so sometimes I see that the problem is really big and the study is fantastic and it can resolve uh, and, and give the answer, but it's already known what the answer is. It's not novel, it's not original, all right? So there's no controversies. We already have 20 studies that all said the same thing. They were even bigger, they were even better in design and we, there's no uncertainty about it. So we don't need this study anymore. Although it's a good study, if it was the first study I would be phenomenally interested, even if it was the third study but not if it was 21st study on this problem, okay? So that's the problem. And sometimes there is a clear 
uh, uh, controversy uh, and uh, clear solution, but the problem is not worthy of investigation. It's just not big or important enough uh, problem to study. It's just so obvious uh, what the study is going to find that that it's not worth um, you know doing really or reporting because everyone already intuitively can say that this will or will not happen. So that's the first problem. Uh, the third problem with uh, with the study. So you need to really think and ask yourself when you're doing your research. Is this a problem important and worthy of investigation? Are there remaining controversies and gaps in knowledge? And what, uh, is, is, is it what I'm doing here going to fill those gaps or resolve those controversies? So you remember what I told you when I told you about your PhD, uh, that it has to be novel and your own work. Remember, so novelty clearly comes as an underlying thing and theme here in, in this. You have to convince people that this is what you're doing is novel and is going to advance uh, knowledge, all right? So now you know how to structure the good introduction. Just have three paragraphs, no more than three. They can be longer, some of them shorter, some of them. And try to address these three things. And if you know what you need to do in each paragraph of your introduction, then you know what to do, OK? So your introduction should allow everyone to assess, is this an important topic, novel enough? Are there really gaps? Are there really controversies? And can this study really fill or resolve the gaps? OK? So that's your introduction. If you know how to do this, it's about page, page and a half. That's what it needs to be in length, depending on how like, long the, the rest of the paper is. OK? So that's what you're targeting. So half page for this, half page of this, half page for this. That's it. Next, methods of the paper. Well, I've been all over the world. I've, been, I've seen papers written in all sorts of cultures. And the more you move away from top universities, into a very poor research capacity, the more you will see how methods of the paper become tiny and, and half a page, whereas in the top universities, the methods can be like seven pages of the paper, you know, and, and then a lot of supplementary material. The methods need to be described in phenomenal level of detail because they have to allow us to completely re replicate uh, what's been done somewhere else in exactly the same way. So the good methods section usually has many subsections and represents the most extensive part of the paper. For me, the paper, the longest part of the paper must be the methods section. That's what I want to see, that every tiny detail uh, of how everything was done was thought through and reported in a logical order, all right? And if I can follow it, but I can see that some parts are missing, so I won't be able to replicate what is done, that means that something probably wrong happened there and they're trying to hide it. So I always, as a reviewer, ask, could you please explain how did you get from that point to that point? Because I can't see that. You know, if I wanted to replicate your study, I would not be able to do this because I'm missing this bit and I'm missing this bit of information. I can't find it in supplementary information either. So please, or send me the code, send me the software. No, it has to be completely replicable. So the first part of your method section is usually the design of the study, which hypothesis will be tested using what designs. Then your study population, detailed description of key characteristics relevant for the study. We, we, we need to know firstly the design, then we need to know the population, then your methods of randomization or classification into different groups. How did you define the case? Remember how important that is. Uh, probably the screening test, sensitivity, specificity, sampling, what is it, one, two, three stage design. Any adjustments, anything that went wrong, any drop out rate, you have to report it to very great detail. Who dropped out? Why? For what reason? And so on. So because all these things could matter and change the, uh, the end conclusion. And then finally, in the fifth part, you report on exact statistical methods for estimating the probability. But this is usually the small section. So you can see that if you're doing a research, the vast majority of important things is actually in designing and conducting the study. This only comes at the end and tells you how uncertain can you be in your, um, your result. Then comes the results of the paper. Now, results of the paper, you also need to know how to report. Because the good results section should not try to interpret, let alone overstate, the importance of findings. It should be written as concisely and clearly as possible, 
and tables and figures need to be simple and easy to understand. So what am I saying here? You should not uh, uh, conflict uh, the results and the discussion. Discussion is a separate part. Many young people who start writing papers, they want to put together results of discussion because they don't know what should be a result and what should be a discussion. So they just want to say results and discussion because it's a lot easier for them because they don't have enough experience to know what goes where. In results, mainly go um, some data analysis in four to six graphs and tables or whatever in quality research is going to be something different obviously but you know you shouldn't have more than four to six graphs and tables and you should start with the most important finding and you should only say what you found and you should not replicate in the text what is already in the table or in the figure but because of this the tables and figures need to be self-sufficient they need to be able to stand sufficiently so rem remember this any table any figure you use whoever reads the paper, most people just read the title, screen the abstract and then go straight to tables and figures and don't read anything else. This is how the vast majority of papers are uh, read. You know, look at, the, um, look at the title, okay, I'm interested, quickly screen the abstract, okay, I'm still interested, and then go to the tables and figures and study them in detail. Because of this, you have to, in the captions for the table, in the legends, and in the figures, you have to be able to, to you have to explain every single thing what this shows, so these legends can be quite substantial if necessary, because that's what people will really certainly look at and read. And you don't then need to repeat any of that in your results section. And the results section, you start with the most important finding, then the second most important, the third most important, and that's it. You know, you don't need to, to have more than that. And then maybe a table or two, but, but no more than six really. And, and usually it's between three, four, and, uh, and, and six. So in results, very dry, just what you found. Don't say why you found it or what do you think this means. This does not belong in results. In results, you should not make any interpretation, any uh, personal um, you know, emotional or uh, you know, cognitive uh, interpretation of what this may mean. You know, or you don't call them these are very nice results or they, they nicely present. They have to be very dry, very objective, impartial presentation of what you actually found and what your tables and figures are showing. Okay, so that's, that's, the, um, that's how you write your result. And it doesn't have to be long. The, you can have text and figure, uh, tables and figures, but the text should be quite short and should not repeat what uh, is being said. All right. So once again, present results in four to six tables of graphs. Description of those graphs needs to be sufficient to understand them fully. Textual part minimal should only focus on presenting answers to study questions in order of their importance and significance. Minimize repetition of results that are already presented and impartial and should not attempt to discuss or interpret results. Okay? And finally you get to the discussion of the paper. So this is the fourth part. Now, I can easily teach anyone to write an introduction based on what I just told you. I can easily teach anyone to then learn how to report the methods, you know, step by step so that everything can be replicated. I can easily teach anyone to develop a table, develop a figure, and then uh, explain everything in the text in a very dry way. But for people who are young, the writing a discussion is incredibly difficult. So that's not easy to teach anyone. That has to be learned over time. Now, it's a lot easier to learn it when you know what needs to go where and what do you expect as the discussion. Do you remember the introduction, how it went from general to more specific and then to the most specific? So, all the world, biggest problem, what has happened previously in many places and what this particular study is going to do. Now, the discussion is like the mirror image of the introduction. Firstly, you remember what you said you would do. Did you do it? Did you answer the question in the way you say, then discuss how this fits in previous controversies, in previous studies, in previous knowledge. Uh, and finally, what are the wider implications on the big and important question that you uh, addressed and what should be the further approaches in future studies, all right? So, um, let me take you through, because some of these things are much easier and some are much more difficult. Let me take you through, because this part too has three different subsections, all right? So what's easy 
is to know that you start your discussion with a paragraph which looks back at what, what was your last paragraph in your introduction, look back at it and just now answer. You know, did you do, did this study achieve what you said you would achieve? Because you proposed in the last paragraph of, of introduction that you would achieve something and conduct something for this study. Now you have to say, did you achieve it? Did you do it? Um, so did, did the study answer the question? Did, or did you encounter a problem and you were not able to answer the question? All right. Then I'm going to take you to part three because this is again much easier. The last two free paragraphs is uh, now what are the wider implications of this? Did, does this change the perception of the problem? Does this have impact on policymakers? Should policies be changed? Should treatments be changed? Should thinking be changed? And then what would be the priorities for further research now that your information that you generated is taking into account? What are the next steps? So all that comes here, all right? And then you have this middle part which is difficult, all right? But even the middle part doesn't need to be too difficult. Let's just know what, if you know what goes where. So after you said that you answered your question or you didn't, firstly, say what are the strengths of your study? And this is where you need to show that you understand the world literature well. This is where you say this study was the first one which tried this design or this study was the first one that had the larger sample size, over 10,000 people. Or this study was the first one that was conducted in India, uh, you know, or in Southeast Asia. Or this study was the first one which used blinding. Or this study was the first one that used the, you know, two-step or three-step diagnosis um, or screening. So, uh, or this study was the first one that implemented a completely new um, algorithm or some sort of thing, you know. So, so uh, these are your strengths. Was the sample size large? Was the uh, study really well designed? Was the, were there any exceptional circumstances around this study that allowed you to see something that other people can't see? You need to show to the reviewer that you're aware of your strengths of the study, that you're aware of why your design was there or something like this, you know. So, so that is how it works. And then because we need so many things to do research well, we have developed a number of guidelines as, as medical journal editors uh, which are assisting uh, the authors and the reviewers in, uh, in writing papers in the right way and always having checklists whether they've done everything correctly. For example, STROBE stands for International Collaborative Initiative of Epidemiologists, Methodologists, Statisticians, Researchers and Journal Editors who are involved in the conduct and dissemination of observational studies with the common aim of strengthening the reporting of observational studies in epidemiology. Because many times we have all these observational studies reported but we have no idea uh, what uh, stands behind those numbers and you know then we want to do systematic review, try to bring them all together to be able to um, uh, answer the question, but we can't do this because we just simply have no idea what's, what's, what's behind those numbers. So incomplete and inadequate reporting of research hampers the assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of the studies reported in the literature. Do you remember what I told you? Consistency of findings establishes uh, um, eventually what is and what isn't. And you can't talk about consistency of findings if all studies have been done in completely different ways. Then you can't assess consistency. You want to assess consistency if you understand what each study was, uh, um, what, what was behind each number so that you can basically then uh, even the studies that are not supportive, you can understand why perhaps they are not. But if nothing is reported, then you can't do anything. So readers need to know what was planned, what was not planned, what was done, what was found, what the results mean. Strobe's statement is being endorsed by a very large number of biomedical journals these days. What is CONSORT? CONSORT stands for Consolidated Standards of Reporting Trials encompasses various initiatives developed by the consort group to alleviate the problems raising for inadequate reporting of randomized control trials. So the problem with randomized control trials, again, do you remember those incentives I was telling you about in evaluating treatments? So basically the incentives are such that people don't say what they plan to do. They start a randomized control trial. They see a tiny effect on something, whereas there is no effect of something else. And then they just report the, the subset of the study, uh, which then shows positive value in a much bigger study, which shows negative value. And this just misleads the entire 
community. So the main product of concert is a concert statement, which is an evidence-based minimum set of recommendations for reporting randomized controlled trials. It offers a standard way for authors to prepare reports of trial findings so that people can believe them, that they've reported everything they've seen, that there's nothing between the lines, nothing hidden under the carpet, you know, that you can trust what, the, what they report. The concert statement comprises a 25-item checklist and the flow diagram along with some brief descriptive text. The checklist items focus on reporting how the trials was designed, analyzed, interpreted. The flow diagram displays the progress of all participants through the trial. So you need to know what happened to every single person who entered because sometimes they just drop some people and then suddenly something that was not statistically significant becomes significant and they make it they drop it based on some assumption that they've introduced, uh, which is not reported. So you, you have to be aware of these things, you know, Other, and, and because that tracking them backwards shows you that they were always trying to increase their chances to find the positive results in a randomized controlled trial. What is grade? The grading of recommendations, assessment, development and evaluation working group began in the year 2000 as an informal collaboration of people with an interest in addressing the shortcomings of present grading system in healthcare. Since the 1970s, a growing number of organizations have employed various systems to grade the quality or the level of evidence and the strengths of recommendations. Unfortunately, the same evidence and recommendation could be graded as 2B, C plus 1 or strong evidence, strongly recommended, depending on which organization or system was used. So it's not a standardized, but actually it all means the same. Are you saying that something is effective or ineffective based on a strong or intermediate or weak level of evidence, you know, so in your systematic review. So, the GRADE working group has developed a common, sensible and transparent approach to grading quality of evidence and strength of recommendations. Many international organizations have provided input into development of the approach and have started to use it. What is Cochrane collaboration? So the Cochrane Collaboration is an independent, not-for-profit organization consisting of a group of over 28,000 volunteers in more than 100 countries. The collaboration was formed in response to a felt need to organize all research information in some systematic way. Such organization of information is required so that all information is reviewed before making a healthcare decision. The collaboration aims to provide compiled scientific evidence to aid well-informed healthcare decision. It conducts systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials of healthcare interventions and tries to disseminate the results and conclusions derived from them. A few more recent reviews have also studied the results of non-randomized observational studies. So all those systematic reviews are published in the Cochrane Library and there is also the journal for Cochrane reviews. So what is this? This is about evidence-based medicine. This is a movement which is saying that we should not do anything in medicine unless we have evidence that it is effective. All right? So this collaboration constantly looks, after, looks for evidence and assembles and accumulates evidence of various studies on implementation of interventions because in medicine primarily we don't want to harm. All right? So this collaboration believes that we should not harm and the best way not to harm is to firstly check whether what we're doing it has any effect and then not do it unless it does. And for, for uh, so this, this is all about consistency of uh, findings, but not about the risk factor. This is about the consistency of finding about the effectiveness of intervention, basically doing systematic review and looking at the whole thing. Now, how do you assess the evidence? The big problem, as I said, with the evidence out there is that it's all biased towards positive findings. So if you're going to review only positive findings, uh, then you're always going to find that something is effective. So how can you know what has been tested yet not reported? Well, there is some very uh, clever ways of this because we know that the effect sizes, there is a kind of a distribution. Smaller studies should have larger effect sizes, uh, as uh, bigger studies have smaller effect sizes. And then um, uh, if the distribution of effect sizes that we see across published papers is only 
half of that triangle, then we assume that there is another half of the triangle which didn't show an effect. But if the entire distribution of effect sizes from big to small happens in everything that's published, then we don't expect many of the things to be left that are not uh, published. So it's a visual aid to detecting bias or systematic heterogeneity. It assumes that the larger studies will be near the average and small studies will be spread on both sides of the average. And if you have variations from this assumption, this means a publication bias. So this is a, a, a simple visual way to test for a publication bias of all the publications that you uh, put in your systematic review. And then these reviews use, use these so-called forest plots. Every study is represented with the actual effect size and the confidence interval. Smaller studies have smaller dots, bigger studies have bigger dots, and the bigger studies obviously have narrower confidence intervals. Smaller studies have wider confidence intervals. That's all logical. And you look across them and you are trying to show that it's going to be different than zero. So you can see here that all the bigger studies are um, definitely moved away from zero on the right side. Only the small studies are falling on the left uh, side. So this is a good evidence from several studies here, many studies actually, you know, all these studies put together that there is some effect. So this forest plot allows you estimation of the effect of a risk factor or effectiveness of treatment. The collaboration, the Cochrane collaboration gained the official relations with the World Health Organization in January 2011 as a partner non-governmental organization and they now have a seat on the World Health Assembly to provide inputs in World Health Organization's resolution. So this is how it's grown uh, and uh, in how important and influential it has become over time. Okay, so this is what you need to know about reporting your research and I think that now you know more about how to structure your research article than you did before this uh, lecture. So think about all these things and think about whether with your article you need to also report on strobe guidelines or do a, uh, um, you know, something else, grade uh, and so on in your supplementary material. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. <laughs>